I'd like to begin today with a story that you might be familiar with. And so with this story, there was a woman um, in a village, and for some reason, she started to go thin. She grew thin, thin, and thinner by the day. The other villagers who lived in the village with her became very concerned. And so they assumed that she was going thin because she didn't have food, so they started to bring her food. They brought her food, they brought her food. So that food that they were bringing was out of the kindness of their hearts. Over time, because she continued to grow thin, they started to get angry. They didn't understand why they were doing so much and yet saw so little as the result. As they were gathered around her one day, an old lady elbowed through the crowd. She came through, and in her voice, although it was still frail, she tried to shout, stop giving her food, stop giving her food. And then she edged closer to the woman and passed her a concoction. You see, that old woman knew that really what was keeping her from eating was the malaria. You cure the malaria, you cure the problem, the woman starts eating again. The moral of this story lies in what is our everyday reaction when we encounter problems. We tend to go and look towards the symptoms and not the underlying root causes. So this picture on the screen that you see now, for many of us who were not born on the continent, that or something like that was our introduction to Africa. And so when we saw that, we thought, surely Africans don't have money to build water systems. Because why else would it be that there's a woman looking like that, getting her water in that way? Why else would it be that there are children getting water via jerry cans in that way? So my goal today in this talk is to have us rethink what is ultimately an access challenge and to have us rethink the conclusions that we have drawn. Because in the end, so much money has been poured into addressing what we think that picture tells us, and yet today, I'm still on this stage talking to you about an access problem. Before I moved to Kenya, I worked in the US for the last 10 years or more on water-related issues. And the types of issues that I tackled were primarily of three types. Availability, purity, pressure, predominantly. Availability, does a town or a city have the reserves that it needs to continue supplying water to the citizens, to the residents, for the next 5, 10, 20 years? On the issue of purity, you ask, is the water clean enough? And if it's not, what kind of treatment do we need to put in place? Or um, what kind of filter so that we can make it clear, sparkling, bubbly? Pressure, very simply, when you turn the water on, is it going to hit your back like the beating of a drum? Since moving to Kenya, these issues have taken a back seat to this basic question of access. And when I say access, what I mean is, can I get the water that I need when I need it without having to think about it too hard? In contemporary Kenya today, in Nairobi, when we think of what the access problem looks like, this black storage tank that you're seeing there is probably the most visible symbol that this problem still exists. We don't know when Nairobi water is going to come. We don't know when it's going to go off next. So we have, water, we, we have a black storage tank so that we can stockpile our water to ensure that we have water continuously. Some of you might now be wondering, well, who is this person anyway? How did she get here talking to me in this room about this issue of access? So if you guessed that I was from the continent, I probably gave it away earlier, but I'm not. I grew up in Antigua in the Caribbean, a very tiny island. Um, and after that, I went to, uh, um, to do my undergraduate degree at the University of the Virgin Islands. And for graduate school, I went to the University of Wisconsin, where I did my degree in civil and environmental engineering. After graduating, I had what I thought was my ultimate dream job, and it was with American Water at this water company. I soon came to realize, though, that that dream job would be one of a series of many, including the running of my own advisory firm in Washington, DC. In 2013, um, I got a call from IBM, 
And ultimately, I was invited to be one of the inaugural members of the first commercial research facility um, on the continent. And with our research lab, the goal is that we now work to develop commercially viable innovations that make a difference in people's lives. And so for the areas in which we do this, we look at healthcare, human mobility, education, sanitation, energy, water. My role is to lead up our water initiatives and I think about how technology can make a difference. So this water tank that I've pointed to, one of the things that we're looking at, for example, is to think about how do we make it smarter? And there's someone in the audience who I want to acknowledge. So one of our interns, and she's now going to be with us for the rest of the year, Elizabeth, who's helped us work on, on that particular project is in the room. You wanna just stand for a little bit? So, she's graduating from Technical University um, at the end of the year, and then she'll hang around with us for, for the next year. I wanted to just highlight what it is about Elizabeth that's so special. So she's got a tenacity that's just unbelievable. So for us to be able to do what we do, we're looking at how we can co-create to evolve the next generation of technologies uh, that make sense. And also for this smart water tank um, that you see here, in the talk that we had earlier around the irrigation system, the smart water tank would also be something that would fit in an irrigation system like that one. However, so this tank, as we're looking to develop it, what does it mean that it's smart anyway, right? Essentially, does it talk to you, does it feel? The idea is that instead of having to call, is, instead of having to run out of water and then call um, the delivery truck, if your tank is equipped with a sensor and if it's connected to the cloud and you can now on your mobile phone know what's happening in your tank at any point in time, then a lot of the anticipation and thinking can be done for you. And so this is what Elizabeth works on with us. So through the process of working on this smart water tank, and in the process of thinking about the range of technologies that we are evolving, one question continues to persist though. The tank is still going to be there. And so if the tank remains there, then it means the underlying problem around access is still there. So as we continue moving forward and looking at how we innovate for the future, what is it that we're going to do regarding this access problem? So we are at a point now where most countries across Africa have had independence for 50 years or more. We are 10 years into the Millennium Development Goals and yet we're still having this access question. And I want to reiterate, when I say there's an access problem, what I mean is that hours and hours are spent thinking about how to get water. We have to rely, we have to wonder, we want to know when is this black storage tank going to be filled? For the farmer, his refrain, his cry, his worry is, I hope it rains, I hope it rains, if he doesn't have an irrigation system. So why is it that we are still at the place where we are today? Many have pointed to just the physical availability of water. With the recent find in Turkana, I haven't seen one critical piece that says the water is there, but then what? But over and over, we have seen that water has never been one of the challenges across sub-Saharan Africa. Under normal everyday conditions, the lack and availability of water has never been what has prevented access. In the 1980s, Fela Kuti in his song, The Original Sufferhead, said that there's water underground, water overground, water in the air, but yet we still don't have any. That cry is still relevant today. We have examples aplenty. If you look at Kisumu, the governor there, he's still trying to make good on his promises to provide clean water to the residents of Kisumu. Kisumu is right next to Lake Victoria. You can see Lake Victoria from space. How much more water can we talk about? Congo. Congo has 22 times the water resources of the United States of America, the entire United States. And yet, individuals in Congo still do not have access to water readily, freely flowing and available. So if we can now disabuse ourselves of the notion that physically water isn't available, then what's next? 
The next popular meme that we tend to go to, the engineers, the scientists, the policy makers among us, we talk about money. It seems to make sense. Maybe if we had more money, we could build more infrastructure. But really, Africans, Africa does not have water because there isn't money. If you've been in Nairobi for the last two months or so, you might, might have seen this picture. Do you remember him? The Luo guy who went to pick up his wife, a new baby, in the stretch limo with the champagne? We don't have money in Kenya, really? Look at where we are in this auditorium. This could be anywhere in the world. Look at this campus. Look at Karen, the town of Karen. Have you seen it? Lavington, our state house. We don't have money. The last elections, 300 million was the bill. We have security cameras that are coming up, 200 million. It can't be that we don't have money, and that's why there isn't access to water. So the other thing that we can also think about is how would it be that across 40 plus countries in sub-Saharan Africa, all of the governments have somehow colluded to ensure that there's scarcity. When does that kind of organization ever happen anyway? ECOWAS, EAC, regional initiatives are tr still trying to accomplish their lofty goals, and yet somehow across 40 plus countries, there's an access problem that was coordinated. I don't believe it. So where are we? We're at a point where still today I'm on this stage talking to you about access. If it's not money, and if it's not the physical availability of water, what else can we look at? So perhaps one approach and one thing that might help is if we take a look at the other places around the world that have been successful at eliminating this access problem. We can begin by taking a look at the Romans. So the Romans believed that water was essential. It was the key ingredient that they needed for their communities to thrive. And with that, they, with this mindset, they put in place the systems and the structure that would ensure that they always had waters in their towns. So the aqueduct is what you see there, was one of the key mechanisms for this. Vitruvius, he was the Roman author and engineer, and he said, without water, neither the animal frame nor any virtue of food can originate, be maintained, or provided. Hence, great diligence and industry must be provided in seeking and choosing um, the, to serve the health of man. So he, and I guess what this tells us is that even before the first stone was laid to build the aqueduct, they could imagine and they could conceptualize what it was that they wanted, and they had the ability and the wherewithal to make this happen. Another contemporary example that we can look at is Dubai and the U in the UAE. So 60 years ago, Dubai had no water. Today, they're the third largest, they have the third largest per capita consumption of any country in the world. How is it that they did this? So if we look at these um, countries and the many others like them, in the end, is it that they had the ability and the wherewithal to come together and imagine the systems that made sense for them? And in the end, was it the ability and the wherewithal that they had to now develop the infrastructure that made sense and that was lasting for them? Ladies and gentlemen, I think that we have misdiagnosed the water access problem for the last 50 years. We have been too quick to go and focus on the obvious. It is my hope, it is my goal, it is my dream to encourage us to rethink and reconsider this access problem. If we do, we may, in the next, we may in a shorter time than the next 50 years find a more lasting solution. Thank you.